on the next slide, I will just briefly explain how you can ask some questions as we go through the webcast. So if you have questions, you can access in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen where you see Q&A and type and send your question to all panelists. And so at the end of the session today, we can hopefully answer any of your burning questions that you have. So without further delay, I would like to introduce Dr. Maren Eggers to speak first. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Richard, for this nice introduction. And I'm very grateful to be here today and to present um, what is known about influenza and SARS-CoV-2 and what are the differences and what can we do to uh, don't get a pandemic. Next slide, please. So um, we have now uh, a season where we could have a double thread of seasonal flu and COVID-19. Next slide. And um, my uh, presentation is divided uh, into four parts. First, I will introduce you uh, some points of influenza virus. Probably you know about it, but just for uh, but it's just important to uh, know this point to differentiate between coronavirus and influenza virus. And um, then we will talk about the roots of transmission, but only short, because I think that Mr. Panet will uh, have there more in his uh, presentation uh, on this topic. And then what is uh, um, the difference or what makes SARS-CoV-2 such kind of a pandemic? Um, and uh, that we will address in the third part of my talk. And then I will also mention a, far, a little bit um, of the vaccine and what we can expect um, about these vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. So um, first of all, I want to introduce that there are more than one or two uh, viruses that um, are the causes of respiratory virus infection. Uh, we have the rhinoviruses. There are more than 170 types. Adenoviruses causes um, flu-like symptoms. And also uh, other viruses like metapneumovirus or Boca virus. Um, metapneumovirus is related to uh, respiratory syncytial virus, which is uh, a big, big threat in the uh, newborn, especially in and, uh, Weakenborn babies. Then uh, Boca virus is related to parvovirus B19 and very difficult to disinfect, but it's a harmless cold like infection. Then we have uh, coronaviruses. Uh, we know them since the 60s, but um, now we have also three new coronaviruses. I will address this in later in, the, in my presentation. Then, of course, the influenza virus and SARS CoV 2. This is the virus that uh, is um, uh, causing the COVID-19 disease. Next slide. Let's start with influenza. Next slide. Yeah, we have three, three types of influenza, type A, type B, and type C. And the type C is without any clinical relevance. And I must say, since 25 years working in this field, I have never, ever known somebody who was infected with type C. So in the vaccine, it's only type A and type B. And we have always, each year in the seasonal um, vaccine, two type A's. Um, they have uh, different hemagglutinin or neuroglutinases. Now, at the moment, we have H1N1 and H3N2. And uh, influenza A viruses are um, uh, a little bit of threat for the uh, vaccine uh, producers because they mutate, mutate each year and they can uh, also cross the species barrier between dogs and uh, humans. But mostly the new viruses come from uh, water birds, from ducks, for example, um, which are in, in Chinese, in the Chinese mar markets, very near together with chickens, for example, and then a new uh, influenza virus can um, come out of these uh, double infections of the birds. Other uh, animals which are very known, uh, well known as mixing vessels are the pigs. 
So a chicken virus and a tick virus mix together in one cell and you get a new virus. Um, type B is only, um, can only infect humans, but we have the two lineages now, the Yamagata line and the Victoria line. Uh, oh, it's cut out uh, there, but it's the Victoria line. And so we, I would recommend we should get a flu shot with the tetravalent vaccine. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, this is an amazing uh, story from for me as a virologist because this shows the pandemic influenza um, from 1500 to 2009. That was the last uh, influenza pandemic, and you see we have uh, a lot of pandemics then, and it's almost three pandemics per century. You can say. Next slide, and uh, this. It's uh, also very special. If you have a pandemic flu, then you have a different um, fatality um, rate, and then you have got a U-shaped um, mortality curve. Uh, but uh, with the seasonal flu, which we have now, we have this blue line. It's the um, not, uh, that's the U-shape. Sorry, and the other one is the W-shape. The Pandemic flu caused the uh, W shape line, and the usual flu has always the U uh, shape line because we have then uh, the very uh, small children. They can be, um, they have a bad, um, <clears throat> a serious uh, influenza infections, and also the elderly are affected of uh, seasonal flu and can die. Next slide. Um, but um, during a pandemic influenza, the elderly are more protected because of serum cross-reactive antibodies. This can be due to a related virus that occurs in the influenza season or um, they have more exposures to seasonal flu vaccine than the others. So they have kind of immunity, or they had, uh, or they had a um, flu pandemic in their uh, younger adult health, um, as a young adult or as a child. So they are some kind of protected, but the young adults not, and that's why we have the W-shaped uh, mortality curve. So in a worse pandemic of um, influenza. The young adults between 20 and 40 uh, died. Uh, H1N1 was a really mild uh, influenza pandemic. Next slide. And here you can see the fatal cases of the influenza um, during the pandemic of seasonal influenza in the USA. And you see in 1918, 1919, the Spanish flu, 500,000 people died in, in the United States. And uh, in the H1N1 um, pandemic 2009, only 12,500 died. This is less than in some annual flu seasons that uh, can, uh, especially in the H H3 and 2 season, um, that can be uh, up to 300,000 deaths a year. And uh, I have also their uh, column with the COVID-19 death rate in the United States, you see almost half of the Spanish flu. And uh, to be honest, I think we are in the first year of the pandemic, but the pandemic usually lasts two years until we start a vaccine. Next slide. So most people don't know if they have influenza or just the common cold. Um, common cold is uh, more in the nose and throat area. It starts uh, gradually with uh, only a slightly elevated uh, temperature. And you've got sore throat, feel a slight fatigue, running nose or sticky nose, sneezing or coughing. And most people, we have in Germany, uh, we say it lasts seven days with or without remedy. And that should say that the fast recovery. In contrast, influenza, uh, that is very special for influenza. Uh, we have a sudden onset of illness as it's out of the blue. It's really 
feeling like that because after only one hour, the first at 12 o'clock you feel well, at one o'clock you have fever up to 41 degrees. Then you have also symptoms like headaches, chills, aching limbs, your muscles are aching and coughing, exhaustion. And um, especially children have gastrointestinal symptoms, so the stomach can hurt or also diarrhea. And adults, it's really rare, but can also be a gastrointestinal symptom at the beginning of influenza. The duration is up to 10 uh, days, the strongest feeling of illness, and people need up to six weeks until they feel well again. Incubation time for both viruses, this is really important, is on short, it's one to three days or five days, so it's really short, the incubation day time. So, next slide. And uh, I want to show you this picture, it's an old picture out of an old influenza book, uh, because it shows you how you can identify very easily as a doctor in, during the influenza um, wave that your patient has influenza. You have always this happy kind of face and the people look like they cry. And um, so 80% of the doctors can uh, diagnose the influenza because of the symptoms in the face. Next slide. Yeah, let's go to SARS-CoV-2. This virus is new and behaves really different. Next slide. We know there are seven kinds of coronaviruses in the human being. Four cross the barrier from the animal to human, um, approximately uh, uh, last century or even during the 19th century. And um, they are now in our uh, population and usually we have only mild cold-like symptoms. Uh, but uh, there are three new uh, coronaviruses also crossing the barrier from an animal to human species, but with um, high pathogenic input. The first coronavirus was 2003, SARS. Um, now it's called SARS-CoV-1, but uh, at that time it was SARS. Uh, that was also a virus that originally comes from a bat via a civet cat to human beings. And then when the, in the Chinese market, the civet cats were uh, not allowed in to be there, and uh, they really were, um, couldn't be found in any market anymore, then the virus disease stopped. And um, since now, 17 years ago, we have never ever had a SARS-CoV-1 uh, infection in the world. The other one crossed the barrier um, from the bat to camel, but it's not known when it crossed the barrier, but uh, the camels are infected in the uh, Middle East area. And uh, for them, it's like a, like a cold, so it should be there. You can say as a virologist, if a uh, virus is long in the species, then the symptoms are more mild, like a cold, because the virus don't want to hurt its um, um, the person it is infected or the animal it infected, because it wants to spread very good. And um, so they usually, if they have a long correlation with the human being, then it's got mild symptoms. And for camels, it's like a cold, but for human beings, it is worse, and you've got a fatality rate of 35%. Up till now, 2,468 um, infected people uh, um, could be uh, detected in the laboratory or diagnosed, and from them, 35% die. So that's a really high case fatality rate. In contrast, uh, SARS infected uh, approximately 8,000 people, and 10% of them died. <clears throat> but if we look now on SARS-CoV-2, uh, next slide, uh, that's a really different number. 
you see we have now since March to November, so it's well, up to <laughs> six months uh, or eight months, it's uh, 54 million global cases and up to 1 million, uh, 1 million and 300,000 global deaths. So that's the case fatality rate of 2.43. It's not as high as the other two coronaviruses, but um, it's a number and it spread quite fast. You can see it in, uh, in, on the 11 March of 2020, the WHO declared the pandemic and on 4th April, 1 million people were infected. And now we have 50 fold number of uh, people infected in a very short time. And even uh, a lot of uh, states and countries did shut down, lockdown, and other um, mechanisms to control the fast spread. Next slide. And um, I just want to mention here, I'm a virologist, but I think we should also look on the economic costs of such kind of a pandemic or of a virus infection. And, and this virus is called in, in the JAMA paper as the $16 trillion virus and says that a family of four will have loss of $200,000 uh, uh, during this pandemic and that is quite a number. Next slide. So pandemics uh, are a global challenge and it needs uh, political leadership of uh, with a worldwide view from my point of opinion, my opinion, my personal opinion. And factors that contribute to such an increase in pathogens uh, are an increasingly interconnected world that is shown here in this picture, the urbanization, the population growth, then always, of course, we need super spreaders and the transmission route is also very important, but um, in our world, um, there's less space for some animals uh, like these bats and they come more in close proximity to humans and then they can, these viruses can easily um, cross the species barriers um, and this was with Ebola virus in Western Africa in 2014-15. This was the case with uh, uh, SARS and MERS. We had the Zika virus uh, pandemic where the virus was uh, spread around the world during the football World Cup. So um, in our world, we, we are not in one country. We, are, we have to look on this in a global view. Next slide. And uh, I said the transmission route is very important. And here are the four transmission routes that could be possible for viruses. So influenza, influenza is only transmitted by medium or large droplets, so droplet form route, and via fomite. Um, influenza and SARS CoV 2 can both survive very long on steel and glass, up to 10 uh, days and on uh, other um, stuff like textile or paper up to 24 hours. And uh, for SARS-CoV-2, that's something very special on this virus. It can be um, uh, spread by aerosol particles and remains in the air for hours and survives there for two to three hours. Next slide. And then in fact, the nose first. The nose is the dominant site of SARS-CoV-2 infection. It in fact uh, cells with ACE2. The enzyme ACE2 is the receptor of this virus. And you see here a very nice picture of a cell publication where you see the green is the cilia cells and red is uh, the virus protein in the cilia cells showing that uh, the virus infects the cilia cells. Um, uh, the ciliated cells then uh, uh, get damaged from the virus and uh, then the nose is not able anymore and also the lung if it's so 
uh, more, uh, it will then, uh, after one week of infection, goes into the lung and deeper side um, of the body. And it can also infect uh, the bowl, for example, because there are also ACE2 receptors. And um, then uh, the ciliated cells are damaged and the uh, lung cannot get rid of uh, the virus and other stuff. So then it starts becoming more and more a pneumonia. Next slide. So, uh, and in contrast to influenza, you have a, you have more different phases of infection. Some people, especially young people, don't uh, show any uh, symptoms or don't think they have any symptoms. So they are more oligosymptomatic or presymptomatic. And some get uh, mild illness, like a cold, for example, with a little bit of fever. Most of them have sore throat and dry cough. And later they feel fatigue and have a headache. And some of them have also gastrointestinal syndrome. And um, what? And then they get well again, but all of them have a loss of smell and taste. That is a very unique symptom of SARS-CoV-2. And of these 8% who have mild illness, some of them have also moderate illness with shortness of breath and maybe getting a pneumonia. And then they develop a severe illness with acute respiratory distress syndrome. It's up to 14%. And only 5% have this critical illness with respiratory failure, septic shock, multi-organ dysfunction, and need a long time in the ICU to recover from this infection. Next slide. But also people with, uh, even young people with not chronic conditions can develop uh, long-term symptoms after COVID-19. It's called now the long haulers. And uh, one of five adults have um, after this kind of infection, fatigue, raising heartbeat, shortness of breath, uh, foggy thinking is also uh, a symptom you can find after a COVID-19 infection. And as I told, uh, the persistent loss of smell. This is really a very unique symptom. If you, somebody has loss of smell and taste, then you know it was probably 90 or 9%, I would say, uh, COVID-19 infection. And um, these long-term uh, uh, symptoms um, are due to damage of heart, lungs, kidneys, and brain. So it's first, uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, everybody thought it's a flu, but it's not uh, like a flu, it's something different. Let's go to the next slide. So where can I get infected? And there I really like to show you these uh, Japanese uh, studies. They showed uh, that there are special clusters in their communities. 30 and 60, that means half of them get the infection in healthcare facilities or in care facilities, but also it's not only the uh, patients or uh, persons who need care, it's only uh, also the people uh, who work there were infected and spread the virus to their families. And uh, the others get the infection and in restaurants and bars, workplace, and the live music concert, or chorus group rehearsals, or karaoke parties. Uh, it's also um, known that in churches the virus spread very fast, but also in, uh, in gyms. And uh, what all of them have uh, in common is heavy breathing in close proximity. And what I think is also uh, very important, uh, all, uh, these Japanese people uh, pa uh, paper is that 20 to 39 years old were more pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. They were super spreader and they didn't have any symptoms. So they, can, they spread the virus, but they had no symptoms. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, this uh, is uh, what I think a very sad story. Maybe you know it. There was a wedding in Maine this year with only 55 guests. And of this wedding reception, um, 
30 people were infected and spread the virus 200 miles into the country. Um, there were local cases, and then and there were all secondary and tertiary um, attack rates. So um, it was not the people attending the wedding vet, reception that infected the people in the uh, long term care facility, which was 100 miles away. It was uh, the parent of one of the guests. Um, and uh, there occurred a lot of deaths, of course, because there were the elderly. And uh, but also 200 miles away, a correctional facility were infected with 82 cases, uh, zero deaths, and most of them young, healthy men didn't develop any symptoms. But altogether, there were 177 COVID 19 cases after this wedding reception, seven hospitalized cases, seven deaths were all linked to a wedding reception, and none of the persons who were hospitalized or died had attended the event. And that shows how difficult it is to um, live with this virus because uh, we are spread, spreading as crazy because we are living our life just. Um, that's really uh, so difficult with this kind of virus. Next slide. But we have now 11 COVID-19 candidate vaccines in phase three study. Um, and I want to introduce you um, the RNA vaccines because they are really new. But there are also uh, normal inactivated uh, virus vaccines. Um, they, they were um, developed by three Chinese companies and one Indian company. And there were also uh, genetic uh, engineered uh, vaccines, which is something very special and something very new. We virologists know this only for treatment for cancer, but uh, this technology is now um, showing that it's very fast and that they can uh, develop very fast vaccines against uh, emerging virus. Um, we have non-replicating viral vectors and we have this RNA vaccine and also a full protein vaccine. Yeah. Um, we um, go to the next slide. I want to uh, show you something. Um, I know there's also now another uh, RNA vaccine, but I think they are quite similar. And I just want to explain this new kind of va uh, vaccine with the BioNTech uh, vaccine. These are RNA containing lipid nanoparticles, and you need a very low dose of 30 micrograms to compare if you use a DNA vaccine, you need four milligrams. So it's uh, really a very low dose. And RNA is not very stable. And that was always the problem with RNA. But uh, they found a way with the lipid nanoparticles to um, <clears throat> get a better stability of the virus. And uh, also your body uh, can easily absorb this RNA. The cells absorb RNA. They don't like to absorb DNA, but they like to absorb RNA. And uh, also the body gets very fast rid of this virus. So I think they are quite safe. And um, all of these phase three clinical trials have enrolled more than 40,000 participants. Half of them get a placebo, and the other half get the virus vaccine. And in case of Biontech, they choose 40% of participants to be um, older than 55 years old, because this is the group at risk. But they have also included some teenagers. Um, the efficacy in participants uh, was measured um, for the evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And uh, they, all of them have to, act, uh, with, with, you need two doses. And after the one week after the second dose, the analysis was done. And they found not really any safety concerns uh, during this uh, study. Same as you find with other vaccines too. Also nothing very special. And 94 positive people occurred. And 90% of, of them were in the placebo arm. And that results then in a 90% efficacy. 
in the Moderna in, uh, vaccine has an efficacy of 94%. Even both of them are more than 90%. That is really high to compare it with the influenza vaccine, there you have the efficacy of 20 to 50%. But this uh, is only one phase three study, and we have to see and to wait how this vaccine will then um, protect the vulnerable, vulnerable uh, persons like immune uh, suppressed people, the elderly, the very elderly people, because um, there's a 20 to 80 uh, rule, percent rule. If you are 20, you get 80% of um, uh, immune response against the vaccine. With 80, you get only 20% of immune response. Um, and now everybody is discussing, should we vaccine the elderly or so they don't get a good antibody response? But um, I know this is a really uh, difficult decision for our politicians but and uh, the ethics committees, but I think they come out with a very good solution. Next slide. But I think we can still discuss on some questions. We know now there will be a vaccine available, but we have to be aware that um, it needs more than six months to vaccinate the whole world. They have to produce uh, enough doses. And um, for example, in Germany, you can only vaccinate 60,000 people a day. And at the moment, for example, we get 5 million doses of this uh, BioNTech vaccine. And you need two doses so that 2.5 million people can be vaccinated. And our population is 80 million. So it's only uh, very few people can be vaccinated. And uh, then we don't know um, how long will this uh, vaccine protect you from uh, getting uh, <clears throat> a reinfection? Because we know now. Some people have a drop after three to six months of the antibody response after a wild type SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we don't know how long the protection lasts after uh, vaccination. This uh, is also something we need um, to study in the next years. Usually a vaccine study needs four to seven years. For example, the HPV vaccine or the rotor vaccine, they were studied for uh, four to seven years that um, is necessary to see how really how the how the efficacy of the vaccine um, how the vaccine really performs um, because now we have we know it there it is really active and I'm so happy that we have this vaccine now but we don't know what will be in two or three years have we to vaccinate so uh, there is uh, they need more uh, data. There's more data needed. So, but what I want to emphasize now is, although we have a COVID-19 vaccine uh, available probably in the beginning of next year, there should be. Uh, you should get your flu shot now. It's really important because um, we need to reduce the number of uh, people who get severe influenza and require hospital um, hospitalization, uh, hospitalization because um, our healthcare system can't cope with both uh, COVID-19 and the influenza a seasonal epidemic, so that's called a twindemic. Um, that's so important that we get our flu shots now. And we don't know, maybe both viruses can uh, infect it simultaneously um, somebody, and who knows how uh, this will then uh, interact with the symptoms. Maybe then they are more worse uh, uh, if you get only one uh, virus infection. Next slide. So now my special. Uh, my personal favorite is hygiene, 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 because if a new virus emerges, we don't have any vaccine and antiviral at the beginning. And also now, we have now a vaccine, but it needs time to produce all the vaccine doses. 
so we need still good hygiene. Hand rub or hand wash is so effective and also surface disinfection is really necessary. I know this is more a virus that spreads also via uh, aerosol, so we need masks, social distancing, cup etiquette, and maybe also oral disinfection. Um, this is now included in WHO uh, guidance document, for, um, but only for clinics. If you go uh, to the dentist, uh, then you gargle or get a, a spray. Uh, and uh, there are, I think, 20 uh, clinical studies going on at the moment with oral disinfection. And uh, one uh, was closed one week ago in Malaysia, and they showed that with uh, PBPI or ethanol juggling, you could reduce the um, virus load in the throat. That was not bad. I don't know how long this lasts, 10 minutes, one hour, two hours, a whole day. But uh, this is one uh, measurement that helps um, to control uh, the spread of this disease. And what I also want to add, you need a good laundry disinfection and uh, dish uh, washer detergent because the virus is quite stable against uh, heat and you have to destroy it with a good a disinfectant or laundry or a good laundry detergent or a um, dishwasher dis uh, detergent. Next slide. And how high, uh, effective hygiene is, I want to show you here. This is our statistics from 2013, 2020 uh, of enterovirus. We do always statistics in our lab and we do also the um, virus diagnosis, and uh, these are the clinical isolates of our laboratory. Usually we have up to 200 isolates or more. But this year we've got the samples, but we, but we could found <laughs> uh, nearly no uh, enteroviruses. That is really amazing from my point of view as a virologist that these enteroviruses disappeared this summer. Never happened. Uh, without any antiviral treatment, without any vaccine, uh, we could control the spread of enteroviruses. Next slide. And I want to show you um, that we have in Europe a tiered approach for rapid selecting disinfectants. And I think this is really important that uh, everybody knows that we have this tiered approach. We have the first level, it's the level against um, all envelope viruses, and most emerging and re-emerging viruses are envelope viruses. We test the disinfectant against vaccine virus, and then we, can, we are safe that this uh, disinfectant also is active against SARS, flu, Ebola, measles, whatever. So um, that's why we in Europe uh, say test it against vaccine virus, get the claim effective against envelope viruses and you are safe. Then we have the next level, the second level, it is against the gastrointestinal uh, viruses because they are non-enveloped and need uh, different uh, active ingredients and also alpha concentration and contact time. And uh, there we have a test virus, adenovirus and norovirus. And the third European level shall cover all, almost all viruses, I would say, it's uh, the third virus we test there is the poliovirus, it's the Picoma virus related to these enteroviruses. And um, then you have a disinfectant that's also able to disinfect against enterovirus 71, for example. And of course, you need also immunization um, to control the spread of virus diseases. That is really uh, key. Next slide. So I uh, want also to uh, stress that biocidal formulations are quite complex and um, you need uh, to test the whole formulation, not only the active substance, because the, these uh, substances like uh, such as surfactants or the emollients uh, that is for better feeling of the hands can affect uh, 
with the disinfectant. Some disinfectants perform better, some disinfectants perform worse. So we always have to test the bisatal uh, formulation and not the active ingredient alone. And um, we have to test them with the standardized virucidal efficacy testing methods. In Europe, we've got these EN14476 standard. All of our products are tested with this standard. And um, of course, with these three levels of virus uh, activity, you can choose uh, the uh, area where your disinfectant can be applied. And in case of SARS-CoV-2, all disinfectants should be used with proven effective activity against vaccine virus. I have to say this again because that is so important. You don't need a test against SARS-CoV-2. It's nice to have, but um, the better it is to have a test against vaccine virus. This vaccine virus is an envelope virus that is more stable than all other outbreak viruses. That's why we stick to this claim active against envelope viruses in Europe. And uh, this uh, European uh, tiered approach uh, will be published soon uh, at EU surveillance. It's in France. And that is from our WG1 and WG5 uh, working group. It's from all European countries, one expert from Austria, from Italy, from the UK, from Germany, of course, from France, Spain. So um, all of them uh, wrote together with me this uh, paper and developed this kind of rationale for testing. And I'm very, very happy uh, to have this in, as a virologist, especially in such kind of a pandemic situation. Next slide. Yeah, I want to thank you for your attention. And hygiene rocks, that's what I think <laughs> you know, as a virologist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Eggers. I will pass over now to um, Dr. Barnex, who will talk about infection prevention. Thanks, Ali. So we will go through the, the next slide with the time uh, that we still have uh, ahead of us. Next. Please go to the next one. So quickly, the transmission is a droplet one. So the the big droplet coming from the mouth and the nose could uh, reach someone in front of you and you are speaking or coughing or sneezing. It's possible, so you need a, a close distance. Long-range distance aerosol are maybe possible, but sometimes indoor, and it's probably a very small proportion of infection going through this way. But don't forget the fomite roots and the environment, the surface is contaminated, and through your hands you can contaminate your, your faces. Next. So, uh, particles are from a growing size coming from the lung to the upper respiratory tract, and uh, the virus is mainly at the beginning in the upper tract, so big particles with small range uh, um, are here and can cont contaminate you at short distances. Next slide. So obviously, if someone is coughing or sneezing like that directly in front of you without a mask or without putting a, uh, or coughing in his elbow, it's dangerous, more than one or two meters. Or it's a range of six meters, so please uh, get, go away and run away. But most of the time, the, the range of the big particles is quite small, under two meters. Next. Don't forget that you can contaminate you through the mouth, through the nose, but also through the eyes. It's always forgotten, very often forgotten that the eye is a portal of entry. Uh, the virus on your eyes will go to the tears and then to the tear duct, and the tear duct is voiding directly in your back nose, so you can be contaminated through your eyes too. Next. So, uh, normally prevention is quite easy. All the messages are quite easy. The rules like you see on this French one, wash your hands, do things like that. Next one. But, even with very simple rules like that, it's very difficult to make them apply by everyone all the time. It's all the, about implementation, and implementation everywhere you are, in your business, in your hotel, in your restaurant, it's something complicated. Next slide. And you don't forget also that uh, it's a 
race against the time. When you're sick, normally you, could, you should self-isolate you as the first symptoms appear and get tested. And if you have the COVID, you have only two days to uh, inform your close contacts of the previous days and ask them to isolate. After two days, they are starting, they could start to be contaminated and to disseminate the, vi to disseminate the virus to others. So the contamination chain is very fast and the spreading is very fast. Don't forget that. Next. So are the prevention measures efficient? Obviously, yes. Next. You have a lot of study about what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions. Obviously, the most effective is the lockdown. So if you have no contact with other people, you can catch or transmit the virus. But you can stay at, in a lockdown all your life, and when you are going out, the virus is spreading again. So it's not the absolute measure, even if though it's the most efficient. And as you see, when combining different measures, the efficacy will increase. So there's, there's only one measure that is the, the best one. You have to combine some measure to get efficient, efficacy. Next one. So at the time, what is the most difficult is that one person can't save the world. Everyone has a piece of the solution. And in your business, you should show something, but everyone, your customer, your, your teams, your staff, should do the things if we want to be successful. Next slide. What's the behavior mainly and, and quite uh, quickly? You have three components of the behavior. The first, what is your you belief? And it's a, a balance between cost and benefit. All your choice and your behavior are based on that. What costs me to do something? Is it costly to wash my hand one time? Not every 10 minutes, yes. And what is my benefit? If I feel I will save my life, it's no problem. I will wash my hands. If I feel that uh, the virus is not dangerous for me, uh, and while washing my hands, I will probably or maybe help someone other not to get infected, it's not the same thing. So always think that is the balance between costs for you and benefit for you or others, like in the infection control. You have also the, the norm and the belief. Uh, an exa and simple example, if you, in your business you are, are watching your uh, hand sanitizer dispenser, you will see many people going uh, beside it without disinfecting their hands. And at the time, you will have one and another will do that. And all the time, the third one will obviously and systematically wash its hands because uh, for him, he perceived that disinfecting his hands while entering is the norm. And in the norm also, one important thing is uh, the people you admire the most. If you admire the most, your top manager. If your top manager doesn't believe in prevention and mask wearing, you will not be inclined to uh, wear a mask. It's also important. And the third part is what you are yourself. Do you believe that your behavior will impact things? If I have the feeling that while wearing my, my mask, I will save the world, uh, or I will wear it all the time. If I think that uh, whatever I do, the virus will spread uh, without any possible control, I will not be inclined to do that. So behavior will lead first to intention, then maybe behavior. It's quite complicated. We, we should uh, have that in mind. Next. So be a role model like that. Uh, uh, if you want to promote flu vaccination, get vac vaccinated first. Unfortunately, it was the picture of last year. Uh, this year, we were, as usual, ready to vaccinate all the team together. But at, in my hospital, we are running short of vaccine. And when it's complicated prevention, it's a, really an obstacle. Uh, now we will have to uh, search some point to get vaccinated, uh, one after each other, to make waiting line. And normally, we have 95% of vaccinated people in my team. I'm certain that at the end of this session, it will be far much low. Make it simple. Next. So um, you have many systems and approach of behavior change. This is the one of the Susan Mickey in, in his long, long team. Next. So there's a, a wheel that is quite interesting. You have some uh, things describing uh, what are the, the drive and the motivation to change, the capability, opportunity, motivation. And uh, around that, in gray, some uh, possibility to uh, and in red, especially, some possibility to make intervention. Next one. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of intervention to change behavior that are possible. Each one has some efficacy. The efficacy is partial, and the efficacy is not everlasting. So you have to 
combine them, to put them one after each other, and to adapt them to your situation. Obviously, restriction is the easiest thing to do, but have drawbacks also. And as the restrictions stop, the prevention stops. So you must have in mind that you can do many things, and you must combine approach, communication, information, et cetera, et cetera, to be efficient. Next. So in your business, first, start with a focus group. Just let people speak about what they think of the various, what they know, what they don't know, what they fear, why they are not following the rules, and try to understand that and to improve that. It's very important to take some moments. We have always the idea to first put education, prevention, promotion without understanding the situation. First, assess your situation. Next. An example, if everything is perfect in your business, but the situation is that in public transportation, people will prefer staying at home. So it's not easy to impact the public transportation, but everything is linked. So you have to understand what are the critical points in your organization and business during the COVID crisis. Next. So buyer to compliance is important. You must make things easy to do and to see. Next. It's a, an interesting study uh, about hand hygiene and the visual effect of the position of the hand dispenser. Uh, it's a simulation training, so it was in a real room of patients, but it was a simulation session. Uh, we say to patients, uh, you will enter the room as if it was a patient and, and do hand hygiene as you feel it. So next, there was four positions for the hand dispenser and rub dispenser. Uh, first standard, you see it, uh, when you see, you see on the side of the, um, the dispenser, not very clear. The same one with the LED, so it's, uh, there's a light, so you see it more clearly. The ideal position, it's in front of you when you enter, and the ideal plus the light, it's the best one. So you see after the compliance with the next slide, with the, the thing, so before, so when entering, so you see that the more, next one, please. Go to the next one, yes. Before entering, uh, when you just stand out and the dispenser is not very visible, you have 37.5 of observance. And at the end, when your dispenser is in front of you and is uh, bright, uh, with a bright light, you have two-thirds of observance. So the visibility is very important. And as you see, when leaving the room, it's not the same at all, because when you leave the room, you have not the same vision of the, of the dispenser. So in your own business and your organization, if you want to have an hygiene, while entering and while leaving your uh, business or a room, you should put a, a dispenser visible when entering and one visible when leaving. Next. And even at the end, there was this kind of warning. So it's not the reality because it was simulation, but it was quite threatening. Uh, all violation will be reported if you are doing one. And to your opinion, is there an impact of that? You will see on the next slide, please. A huge one. With this just announcement, 93% while entering, while leaving. So you are searching the dispenser with that. So it can be useful from time to time, but you can do that all the time, obviously. It's not a sustainable method. Next. So the fear was used for communication, obviously. Uh, when you were looking at the journal ping math every minute, every day, uh, seeing the very spreading, it's very frightening. And obviously, you're inclined to to do more prevention after. Next. So communication is very important. You need to be clear. You need to be uh, aware of what is known, not known. And if you are changing your organization, explain why in your own business. Maybe it's because the national rules have changed, but explain it and say how much you have understand why it has been done. Uh, and obviously, you can, do, you can have the same messages for all the people, for the elderly, for the youngster, for... So you have to adapt the message to the strategy and according to the, the, the category of staff you have. And promote all the time behavior change. Next. Uh, a very interesting paper has been released about national communication. They'll analyze the communication of the country that were the most successful uh, in the world uh, while uh, dealing with the, the, the COVID outbreak. And really, what is important, it's uh, not oblige people let them have a piece of autonomy to think, to understand, and to act. Otherwise, you will not have good results at the end. What is important is to play around values, emotions. If you have real stories, it's more uh, important for people, and, and they could uh, 
uh, more uh, imagine the importance of the prevention if they rely it to uh, something uh, real and close to them. So next slide. So system change is com something complicated with many different aspects and you need to have a global vision on that and try to work on it all the time and especially during this special period. Next. Uh, rapidly you can have two kind of type of behavior. All the problems are linked to the others. And uh, if you don't do things, you should be fine. Okay, but it's not the best thing to do. The more interesting to do is to have a positive vision, a fair one for improving things, maybe giving incentive for the team if uh, the compliance is, uh, is very good or things like that. Thinking, is my product good? They don't use it, but is it the good one? If it's a very sticky one, uh, the end hygiene will not be good. It's normal. So if you select a very good product, you will have a much more uh, higher compliance to end hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. Next. So uh, keep in mind that change will, should be quite continuous. You change one thing after another, and at the time this thing is fixed and is no good, it's now good, you can do two other things. Don't try to change everything at a time. Next. Being multimodal is very important. It's a, a study about uh, cleaning and disinfection in, in hospital. Next one. And as you can see, uh, it's uh, an education system. You have pre-education, post-education, and assessment one year after the post-education. And if you see the toilet seat, it was good, already good at the time, but just already good. If you're a consumer, 85% of quality on the toilet seat, uh, I don't want to be on the 15% of non-quality. You don't, uh, I suppose, to. But for all the other, it was a, an improvement, a big improvement, and very sustainable, which is quite rare. Next slide. How they did that while making some kind of focus group. It was just a study, knowledge, attitude, practices. They tried, you see on the right side of the slide, to understand what were the problems and to fix them. Uh, are the, the burden of work too high for making the job? Uh, what are the interruptions? What uh, you understand, what you don't understand? Are you uh, valued uh, in your work, etc., etc. So first, do things like that to understand where your problem and if you know your problem, you can fix them. Otherwise, you can't do that. Next. The culture is very important. Uh, you have this one, this uh, uh, six model national culture used for the marketing purpose. You can you see, see it on the website. And you have six dimensions. The first one is uncertainty avoidance. Uh, those who are very uh, dark on the map are nations who are reluctant, who are, who are fearful against uncertainty. Uh, uh, an outbreak of COVID-19 is a huge situation of uncertainty. And in this country, you find people that are very reluctant to change and then want a uh, legal statement and regulation to, to do things. And uh, you are more inclined in this to, uh, to go too far in the prevention measure. It's, it's very important. If you have some measure, don't do too much. You, we see that all the time. Uh, at the moment, in your uh, store, you have organized passes, everything is going smooth, but people are quite a good distance, and at the time, the virus is more spreading, or you have a, a new lockdown, you try to move things. Nobody asks you to do that, but you move things, and at this moment, everything is more complicated, and instead of improving the, the situation, you have waiting line for uh, 500 meters outside with people quite uh, angry and uh, very close to each other during one hour, so don't be over-preventive. Next slide. And you have other dimensions. And if, like France, you combine individualism and power distance, you have people that are uh, not confident at all in the authorities, scientific or political, and that are not trusting each other in the country. So according to the situation, it's not the same thing to make prevention and to uh, adapt your messages. Next one. So he has a lot of differences, gender differences. Next one, it's an international panel in March wave one, in April wave two. And you see that, that the observance is moving from one period to another, but also that women are far more observant than men. So you have a team with a vast majority of women. It will be easier to implement um, prevention than if you have a team with a majority of men. You, have to have, you need to have that in mind and to adapt also your strategy. Next. 
it's about the the, the French uh, the the French data on on observance in dark blue. You see the mask wearing at the time who have no mask. There were no mask wearing. It, it was quite increasing until. 80% of cell declaration, which is the reality in life. But while gaining two masks, we have lost two uh, social distanciation in the green one, which is very poor and which is far much important, to, largely as much and maybe more important. So the, the, the difficulty is not to lose something when you add something else. It's to keep together the strategy. Next one. So behavior change, uh, it's... A really important thing, but not that simple thing. As I said initially, make the road to observant is in simple. The easiest it is, the more people will gain to uh, observe um, uh, prevention. You need to trust them to create awareness. Don't implement and fix everything. Let your team uh, create something, organize their space, their room to have ideas and to propose you things. If you're a manager, you need to be a role model, obviously. Um, you need to understand things. It's worth paying someone sick at home instead of having a huge outbreak in your work and in the community after. Be aware of some really critical things, the coffee, the coffee break, the, coffee, the lunch, when people are not wearing masks. They are no more in the situation to, make, to be uh, cautious, and they will stop to have uh, distanciation and things like that, and we have a, a huge amount of contamination that. Obviously, try to monitor things. Next. And so at the end, the most important thing, to my opinion, is to trust the idea that if we do implement prevention measures, we will be protected against COVID. And it's the most important to make people aware of that, make people believe in that, and make them do that. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Parnex, and I appreciate for everybody we have gone a little bit over time, but I think uh, you will all agree there was a, a really rich content in, in both presentations from Dr. Eggers and, and Dr. Parnex. I personally have taken uh, a lot from that. Uh, there's a lot I thought I already knew, but there's a lot more than I realized. And, you know, really interesting to see and understand super spreading events like Dr. Eggers showed us from this wedding, you know, we have our bubble, but, you know, our bubbles are interconnected. I think that's really, really demonstrated that for me. Um, the behavior change that um, Dr. Parnex was talking about really makes you understand how to implement measures, how to make it easy for people to do the right thing. And I think there's a lot of messages we can all take to that, to our workplace, and how we make it easy, um, and how we make it right for the people to do, you know, what we know is best. Um, I appreciate that we may not have much time for a question, but we do have one question. I think, um, Dr. Parnex, I don't know if this is something that you would like to answer, but do you think face masks themselves can be a vector of infection when you touch them? So people are being very much aware of how they manage the wearing of face masks. I think face masks are a vector of risk when they are not correctly wear under the nose and things like that. It's quite frequent together, or, or even though we see people that are uh, leaving their mask for speaking because they think it's more polite or it's, uh, it's more easier to speak. So first wear it correctly. After that, uh, avoid touching them. But the problem is when you put it and remove it, you, have, you need to have an hygiene before and after. If you have a good mm -hmm. hygiene, it's of no problem. Uh, so you have the idea, the mask is a protection if you have contaminated hands, it's a protection. So don't be too much, uh, have too much question around mask. If you lose the distance, you need to wear a mask. And if you have an hygiene before and after touching him, or putting him and, leave, and, uh, and giving, uh, get rid of him uh, of it, it's okay. Don't be too complicated with that. Thank you. That's really useful. I mean, you can tell this is a question that obviously has been uh, one of uh, contention, if you, th if you like, thinking about how we use our masks and what we do. I'd like to thank you both for presenting today. Um, as I said, I think I've definitely learned lots, and I hope all of you in our audience um, have taken home some really key messages from today's session. Today's session was recorded, and you will all be receive a link to that recording to catch up on anything that you, you have missed or anything you want to go back on. So again, thank you all for your time. Thank you all for your patience. We've gone a little bit over. And thanks again to Dr. Eggers and Dr. Parnex. Good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.